So we were talking about fermenting, and that is the third step of the brewing process here, is fermentation or fermenting. This sometimes happens when we don't want it to happen, but in brewing, we intentionally want to put the yeast into an anaerobic environment. So anaerobic, as I mentioned before, means without oxygen, and it causes the yeast cells to shift over and go into fermentation. So an intentional process that we're looking for. Uh, as I mentioned again in the earlier, same process is used when we're creating ethanol gasoline or biofuels to use as a source of energy. So we're taking the wort, we're using yeast in this case, and we're taking away their oxygen and the yeast goes into fermentation. So when the yeast is running this anaerobic respiration, let me find another box, it is going to be converting the sugars into alcohol there's a little bit of ATP coming off of this, and ATP, because the yeast need that energy, and CO2. So there's your carbonation. That's where the carbonation comes from when we're fermenting and trying to create beer. So now the fermentation producing the carbon dioxide is what gives beer the fo foamy, bubbly, fuzzy, whatever you want to call it, beer. All right. So you create this in those big vats, the fermentation vats, and then it gets transferred into your bottle, your keg, your can, I'm just going to say et cetera, whatever container that that beer is going to be moved into. So the key is once it's moved into that container, <coughs> keeping it sealed, but you got to kill the yeast kill that yeast so it doesn't continue the fermentation process. What can happen if you don't kill the yeast is if here's your can and your yeast cells are inside here and they're still fermenting, and let's assume the can is sealed, they're going to produce carbon dioxide. That's the little black bubbles here. More and more and more of that builds up if the yeast is still actively fermenting and then your can starts to get swelled out and your can ruptures you have a big ugly mess so for anybody interested in this idea of home brewing but you're like ah, I don't want to make beer I'm not a beer person Try root beer. There are kits out there, homemade root beer. And you're going through a very similar process, different ingredients, but you have to make sure you're, you know, you're, you're following the instructions and the steps. And at the end, you got to kill your yeast or it keeps fermenting. A friend of mine did this. He created root beer, bottled it all, didn't kill the yeast and the yeast continued to ferment inside the bottles and several weeks later all of his bottles started exploding because the pressure the internal pressure built up from the yeast continuing to ferment after they've been bottled so be careful same concept if you guys go to the store and you get a can of vegetables it's a sealed can and if that can starts to swell up, it's because there's usually bacteria inside of it running fermentation. See, some things can live in anaerobic environments. Yeast cells, bacterial cells, there's other things that can survive those environments. So even if the can is sealed, it doesn't guarantee that it's safe if these other conditions persist if the yeast wasn't killed or the bacteria wasn't killed. So be careful. Uh, you know, same thing with 
soy sauce, with any any product, any food product you buy, if it has bacteria in it and it's running this fermentation process, there's going to be a gas produced, and that gas is CO2, and you're going to know it. The bottle of uh, salad dressing starts to swell up, and when you take the lid off, it blows out on you. It's spoiled. There's bacteria in there running fermentation or anaerobic respiration. So be careful with that. Definitely something of concern if you're eating the product. We want to be really careful about that. So, all right, so let's look at the big biology behind brewing here. Here's our big general overview, kind of the, as they say, the 3,000 foot view, the big picture of how all this connects. To get that bottle of beer or that glass of beer or that whatever, you gotta have all this stuff. It goes through this process of energy flow. And energy is moving from one portion of the system to the next, to the next, to the next. So our energy flow starts with the sun in this example. The sun is going to trigger photosynthesis in the plant. But the plant also needs water and carbon dioxide. And as we were mentioning earlier, that plant is barley in this scenario for making beer. So the barley runs photosynthesis, the green parts of the plant run photosynthesis, the chloroplast is the structure, and it's got that green pigment called chlorophyll in it. So let's put that up here. Okay, so chloroplast. Chloroplast is the structure. Chlorophyll is the primary green pigment. That has to be present in the plant in order for the plant to be able to run photosynthesis efficiently. And then their end product of photosynthesis is this CHO. That's a fancy way of saying starch. So that's the energy that is going to be stored within the plant, is that starch. That starch gets handed over to the next level in this pathway. The next organism would be the yeast, and the yeast is going to run fermentation. Now, here's something to point out. If the yeast had oxygen, it would not run fermentation. The yeast would shift over and do what we call Anaero or I'm sorry, called aerobic respiration. That's the process you're doing right now. I'm doing it. We're using starch, breaking it down into glucose. We're using oxygen, and we're making energy that way. But because we deny the yeast the oxygen, we don't allow it oxygen. No. Oh, that's supposed to be a no. O2, we cause it to go through fermentation. Now when fermentation happens, it produces a very minimal amount of energy. Usually fermentation gives the organism two to four ATP, it gives it CO2, and it gives the organism alcohol. Those are the end products. Now you think two to four ATP, that's not a lot. If you're a single yeast cell, that's okay. That's enough. That's good enough. But a human, uh-uh, not enough at all. We cannot survive off of that. We die if we go to anaerobic respiration. But the alcohol is the beer. That's the end product. That's the, the fancy word, the ethanol that is produced that we're intentionally trying to make during the fermentation process. Okay, so this is kind of that big picture, how biology connects to brewing. It's all 
connected to a biological pathway. There's a lot of chemistry involved here. And we talked earlier about if we tweak this, we change this, the amount of sun, etc., that can change the starch that's being produced, which then can impact the end product. So you got this long pathway where if you tweak and adjust any of these steps, it influences ultimately the end product that you have once the pathway is finalized. So all of it's connected to biology. So that entire process is one big connection. So, all right, so let's take a little time to talk about this idea of photosynthesis. So here's a big green field of barley. In order to run photosynthesis, we've talked about the ingredients. It's a basic pathway that the basic pathway that requires, oh, let me get that spelled correctly, that requires ingredients, it creates intermediates, and then it has end products. So the big three ingredients, sunlight plus CO2 plus H2O, oh, oh. those are your ingredients. We're not worried about intermediates. In products, C6H12O6, fancy word for starch, well, glucose, which then becomes starch when it's all shoved together to make a big giant one, and oxygen. All right, so there's the basic concept. And as I mentioned before, keep in mind, the chloroplast most you know the chloroplast is the structure that runs this but it contains green pigment chlorophyll now you can run photosynthesis with other pigments we call those other pigments carotenoids This is like your red, your yellows, what we call the fall colors. They can also run photosynthesis. Those things are going to be contained in a structure known as a chromoplast. So the carotenoid, let's do this. The carotenoid is the pigment. The chromoplast is the structure. But let's just stay with the chloroplast since that's a predominant one all right now anything that is running this the pathway here that makes its own energy is generally called an autotroph these are things we call self-producers typically we say you know what these guys run photosynthesis they will take light energy and convert it into chemical energy that is often stored oops, as a carbohydrate okay autotroph auto meaning self now anything that is capable of or not capable of making its own energy that has to consume it is what we call a heterotroph. Heterotrophs eat or consume energy from other sources. So we consume, <coughs> excuse me, carbs, carbs, proteins, and fats that were produced by other organisms. We then come along and we eat them. We cannot make our own. Now there is this crazy group of organisms out there that can do both, that can make its energy and consume energy depending upon what is available. And those guys are called mixotrophs. <laughs> 
So we'll talk more about how this works when we get into the next part of the lecture.